Good morning. My name is Amar Amwar. I am instructed as the lawyer with a team of lawyers to make this statement on behalf of the family of Fahir Amaz, who is sat on my left, Muhammad Ahmad, who sat on my right, and their mother, Shamim Akhtar, who is on my immediate right, and their family in respect of the incident at Manchester Airport on Tuesday, the 23rd of July 2024. This incident has given rise to active criminal and disciplinary investigations by Greater Manchester Police and the IOPC. The overlap between these proceedings increases any risk of prejudice if information or material is inappropriately disclosed between the investigations or to the public. The family have been placed in a difficult position as they had hoped that the IOPC would be allowed to do its job without interference. Sadly, it has been clear over the last two weeks that there has been a deliberate attempt to smear the family and portray incomplete version of events and thus prejudice, potentially prejudice proceedings. There has been repeated use of the word context when the family have been given no opportunity to provide this. The family have been subjected to horrific racist and Islamophobic abuse on social media and there has been a campaign of disinformation in an attempt to justify alleged police violence. As far as we are aware, there have been no proactive attempts by the GMP to monitor or to investigate the further hate crimes perpetrated against this family. I have now spoken to Catherine Bates, the regional director for the IOPC, with regards to lodging a formal complaint against officers from Greater Manchester Police. We intend in the coming weeks to meet with the director, but also to seek a meeting with the Mayor Andy Burnham if he is actually interested in the context. I will firstly set out today some of the context of what the family alleges happened that day, followed by a list of concerns and requests they wish to make public. The deliberate attempt by some within Greater Manchester Police or so-called police sources to present a version of events to the media in the immediate aftermath and then to claim publicly that they are cooperating with the, new, with the IOPC investigation is deeply unhelpful and can be seen as nothing more than a deliberate and cynical attempt to manipulate and mould a narrative of events and untruths. The family has many serving police officers and believe the actions of these officers do not represent their many colleagues who do a difficult job day in, day out. The family wish to put on record that if the two young men sat next to me and seen on video and stand accused of criminality, their family fully support that they must face robust due legal process. But the family also wish to state that they more, know more than many other families that the police play a crucial role in our society and police with the consent of the people and that it is precisely why when they get it so badly wrong that they must be held to account. Equally, when they get it right, the police should be praised and the family wish to praise on record. Their thanks to the police who for days have have had to face right-wing racist thugs causing violent disorder and spreading fear across England. But it will be clear to many who have watched the horrific violence over the last few days that despite repeated attempts to harm police officers, despite the grotesque and often deadly violence they faced, the missiles, the punches thrown, the arson, the wanton violence they were subjected to that police officers have not been provoked and taken the law into their own hands. In our democracy, we have the right to expect that those in uniform will not act as thugs and will act within the law, and that any force used must be reasonable, legitimate and proportionate. The two young men sat here today, along with their mother and family, are left devastated and traumatised by the incident at Manchester Airport. Despite the clear attempt by some to place disinformation in the media and on social media, the young men sat next to me do not have a single criminal conviction, not even a speeding ticket. In fact, members of the family are serving police officers with Greater Manchester Police and other members of the family in other areas of the country. And Ahmad himself has undergone an interview process to join the GMP. Today is about setting the record straight and issuing a warning to Greater Manchester Police 
that leaking or using so-called police sources to justify alleged criminality by their officers can only be seen as a deliberate attempt to interfere with the IOPC investigation. I want to start now with what sparked the incident, something that we have heard nothing about to date. Mrs. Shamim Akhtar was travelling back from a holiday in Pakistan. She was feeling unwell on the plane and as a result used the empty seat next to her to be able to sit more comfortably. Shortly after making use of the seat, she could hear a male muttering in the row behind her. At first she paid no attention, but then the male went out of his way over the course of the next several hours to subject her to a tirade of alleged racial abuse. He repeatedly called her a bitch. He used the P word and referred to her as a P bitch. Mrs. Actor, for several hours of the flight, was scared the male was going to become physical and assault her. Despite her appeals to the Qatar Airlines cabin crew, they did nothing to intervene. She appealed to the male to calm down, but he refused to listen, despite telling him she was unwell. The male began to call her a pee bitch again, and the male stood up behind her. He was towering over her and hurling abuse. It was a mixture of abuse in English and in Arabic. At this point, she became increasingly frightened and intimidated. He was over six foot tall and was of large build. The male's wife intervened and told him to stop and asked him to sit down. However, the male continued and his children were also ridiculing Mrs. Actor. Even though she was feeling extremely unwell, she forced herself up and walked to the rear of the plane looking for a seat. She sat down at the back on a random street, however, was told to move pretty much straight away as somebody else was assigned to the seat. She had no choice but to come back to a seat and sit down and the abuse continued for several hours. The male continued to intimidate her by shouting racist abuse and by being a bully. Once the flight landed, Mrs. Actor says she walked off the plane and walking towards the baggage claim area, she felt something hit her hand luggage and hitting it behind. She looked back and saw the male standing behind her and from what she could make out, he was using his hand luggage to repeatedly bump into her. At that point, Mrs. Actor began to cry. She was extremely traumatized. She was scared. She was upset and stressed and she even collected the wrong suitcase which she did not realize until she eventually got home that evening. As soon as she exited at the arrivals, she saw her two sons and a six, six year old grandson, a six year old grandson waiting for her. She broke down into tears and told them that what happened to her over the last several hours and Mrs. Akta's sons questioned her, which was Fahir and Ahmad, as to what, what had happened and who this male was. She told her sons that the cabin crew had failed to assist her. She wanted to leave, but when they walked past Starbucks, she noticed the male in question and Mrs. Akta froze. Both her sons approached the male and questioned him regarding the abuse. The male was rude and proceeded to laugh in her son's face and an altercation took place. Following this, the family left Starbucks and headed towards the car park. When they got to the car park, Fahir was paying for the parking. I will summarize some of the details because of the ongoing investigation, but police officers, who were two females and a male, approached Fahir, and then, without identifying themselves, immediately grabbed Fahir by the wrist, and I have seen, and many of you will have seen, the footage that has been broadcast by the Manchester Evening News, some of it heavily pixelated, but the context that the family wishes to provide is that if you watch closely, if you watch closely the, 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 the footage, that Fahir is immediately grabbed by the wrist, as can be seen on the CCTV. The male officer proceeds to grab Fahir by the neck, and it is alleged that he hits Fahir's head into the ticket machine, at which point the other son, Ahmad, asked the police officer to move his hand from his neck, from Fahir's neck, as he was not resisting arrest. Ahmad and his mother Shamim were shocked at the unnecessary aggression and violence, alleged violence shown from the start. There was no immediate attempt to speak to Fire, to ask him to step aside, to caution him, or to simply say, can we speak to you for a second? The family appreciates you have seen leaked footage with pixelation of the top of vital events as they unfold. However, this is what the context of what took place. When Ahmad asked the police officer to remove his neck hold, it is alleged by him, 
and his mother and others, that the male officer then proceeded to punch Ahmad twice in the side of his head, at which point Ahmad falls onto the ground. Mrs. Actor also falls to the ground as the officer pulls her and Ahmad down to the, due to the fact that she was holding Ahmad from behind. The officer, whilst punching Ahmad, pushes her to the ground and she looked up and saw the officer firing his taser at Ahmad, at which point she screamed, they've killed my son in Urdu. And as you can see from the CCTV, pandemonium breaks loose at that point. At this point, Mrs. Akhtar, seeing Fahir running towards the officer and saw that he is also tasered from behind and lands face first, at which point the officer falls down with him. Mrs. Akhtar then goes to Fahir and can be seen leaning over her son as he lies motionless on the ground. The taser that is used is a prohibited firearm and licensed by police officers to use and it can emit up to 50,000 volts of electricity. At no point do you see on the video Fahir reaching for any officer's firearms, as is later claimed in the immediate press release from the GMP, nor is he in fact doing anything other than lying motionless face down. It is at this point, as the officer stands up, he proceeds to run and kick Fahir in the face. Mrs. Actor then tried to pull her son's head away, and as the officer then attempts to stamp on his head, as can be seen in the graphic video at this point. Both brothers are compliant. Fire is incapacitated. His brother is sat some distance behind on a seat with his hands on his head, with officers keeping him under control. The officer then proceeds to lift his foot up and appears to stamp down on Fahir's head. Mrs. Actor states that she attempted to pull her son's head away as she thought the officer could have killed her son at this point. She genuinely believed at this point that her son was dying as he was limp and unresponsive due to being taser. The male is alleged, as seen in the video, then kneels down, the male officer, kneels down on fire, placing his knee on his back whilst he is still limp, and then looks up straight at Mrs. Actor whilst he has his knee on Fahir's back, and he is not moving. At this point, it is alleged that the male officer still has his taser drawn, then using his right hand, it is alleged, he strikes Mrs. Actor directly in the face using his taser at, as a weapon. At this point, Mrs. Actor never, in prior to this or during that point, is presenting any threat to any police officer. At this point, Mrs. Actor screams as she holds her face. She is terrified that she would now be subjected to the same violence as she alleges her son were. This is the bruising that Mrs. Actor had on her face. You'll get copies of this at the end of the press conference. But this is the bruising, some of which you can still see on Mrs. Actor's face today. She was left bleeding from below her eye. This, was, this is what Mrs. Actor alleged she was subjected to. And at no point did any officer approach Mrs. Actor to check on her well-being or her welfare. At no point did anybody seek to get medical um, assistance for Mrs. Actor. And as she screamed, as I state, she thought that she would now face the same violence as her two sons did. Mrs. Actor then held her face, as well as holding onto her son fire. She noticed the officer walked off behind her, and she was scared that this officer would attack her from behind. She looked back and noticed that he then pointed his taser at her other son, Ahmad, who was sat down with his hands on his head and was complying. Even though she had been attacked, she struggled and stood up and saw the same officer that had allegedly attacked her and her son fire then proceed to kick her son Ahmad and drag him down on the floor and use his taser as a weapon to hit her son on his head. Another officer then sat on top of Ahmad and pinned his head down to the floor and proceeded to threaten him. At this point, Mrs. Actor just stood up between her sons who were lying on the floor and at this point you can, she can hear a six-year-old grandson crying and her son Ahmad telling her to go to his nephew. Mrs. Actor touches her face and notices she was bleeding from her cheek underneath her left eye. She was stood there and didn't want to leave her sons as she was genuinely feared for their lives. And she then noticed the officer that kicked fire in the head go over and, tell, and she tells them to stop. At this point, the officer tells her to step back and then a female officer pushes her away as she is moving away. Another female officer then comes behind her and pushes her back, showing, pushing her back away again. 
She was left dazed. She was crying. She was disoriented. But notice the two officers with the mad roll him over onto his front. And at this point, he was handcuffed from the air, the rear. And now they were kneeling on his chest. The officer then grabbed a mad by the neck and pushed his head into the floor before then getting him up and taking him away. She then sees the other officer hit, lift fire and also take him away. No officer attended to her injuries. She was bleeding from beneath her eye. No officer approached her to see if she or her six-year-old grandchild left with luggage strewn everywhere and clearly distressed child crying for his father required any assistance. Mrs. Actor was ultimately helped by a passerby who saw what happened and taken home. Fahir also heard the scream from his mother, which he believes was when his mother was hit in the eye with the front of the taser gun. At this point, he has no idea where he was or what was going on, or he was picked up, but he was dragged out and placed against the wall outside. Fahir states that he broke down into tears and the verbal abuse continued. Then it is alleged that the male officer came and kneeled down next to um, uh, Ahmad and it is alleged he said to him, you dirty fucking cunt, you think you can hit my officers, I'm going to kill you when I see you in my uniform or out. These are the allegations that Ahmad and members of the family make. Hearing this, Fahir said to the officer, why is your body camera not on? He said, it is alleged, I will show you why. He grabbed him by the neck and handcuffs, lifted him up, he proceeds to push his head so far down where it reaches his knees and drags him along, making him walk. It is alleged he takes him around the corner where he can't be seen by anyone else or his brother and throws him face down on the floor and puts all his weight on top of him with a knee over his neck. He then says something along the lines of it is alleged, do you want my camera on now, you dirty cunt? At this point, fearing for his life, all Fahir claims he is thinking about is that he is going to be killed. He stays quiet and doesn't say a word. There is, of course, much more alleged incidents and verbal abuse that takes place that should be on CCTV or police cameras if they were, of course, switched on. <coughs> In terms of the requests that we wish to make of the IOPC and Greater Manchester Police, firstly, as stated previously, we expect all CCTV and police body cam footage to be retained. The family is aware that all body, police body cams of those arresting and detaining officers were not, asked, were not active on that day at the time of the incident and asked the question why. Secondly, our armed officers are highly trained professionals expected to take split second decisions which can have the power of life and death but quite rightly they are expected to justify the decisions they take Carrying a gun does not give a license to kill, does not give a license to use disproportionate violence or to escape accountability. Three, when a laser or pava spray is used, they are classified as potentially lethal weapons. And when discharged, the police body cam should automatically be engaged prior to their use, during their discharge and afterwards. If officers had switched off their body cams, it begs the question why? There is a reason why body cams were introduced in this country, in order to protect police officers from spurious allegations, but also to protect members of the public from disproportionate violence. If officers had nothing to fear, then they had nothing to fear by keeping their body cams on. We also seek to understand on what legal basis the Mayor, Andy Burnham, was shown the complete CCTV and by whom. The repeated attempts by so-called police sources to spin a false narrative or partial context is deeply unhelpful to an IOPC investigation. Leaked footage, of course, does not show exactly what the police did, how the incident began, or the full conduct of the officers in the aftermath of the incident, or all parts of the airport, including after the arrests. Five, the family and the legal representatives should have been the first individuals provided with the opportunity to view the footage before any politician. As for the leaking of the CCTV, we understand that will also form part of the investigation of the IOPC. But whilst it may be blatantly obvious who would benefit from such a cynical and partial leak, proving who the individual or institution is likely to prove impossible. Six, I am aware that Andy Burnham was shown the CCTV before even the IOPC was. 
Seven, we are aware that the GMP issued a press release in the aftermath which senior officers, we asked the question, which senior officer authorised this? When I suspect officers will not even have made a statement on legal advice as to how this version of events was formed, we asked the GMP, how did they come to that consideration? When they are self-referring already to the IOPC. And the question that continually arises in cases such as this is, were officers placed in the room together? Were they allowed to confer? Were they allowed to meet? Were they allowed to discuss situations? Because it was many, many hours later that the officer at the centre of this alleged conduct was suspended. Which senior officer took control of the situation? Who was gold command? What were the gold command notes? Where is the radio frequencies of what was happening? Where is the CCTV of absolutely everything that went on? That as, as far as concerned for Andy Burnham and any other individual that wants to commentate and armchair media commentators is, is actually the full context of what's going on and that is why we find it deeply unhelpful that people have tried to frame a narrative. We have seen far too often in the past in the instances which have resulted in deadly deaths whether it be John Charles de Menges at Stockwell Tube Station several years later we find out that the, the, the facts as alleged by the police turn out not to be true. We saw that in many deaths in police custody. At a high security airport, access to CCTV would be in a highly secure area for obvious reasons, with limited access. There would be an audit trail, or should be, of every police officer or civilian with access to CCTV material. There will be cameras in the CCTV control room, and we expect all material relating to the incident and cameras of the aftermath to be retained, especially those where detainees were taken to in other areas of the airport. If individuals, whether it be Ahmad or whether it be Fahir, are dragged outward into areas that are outward of cameras, the IOPC and the GMP should be asking those officers, what exactly are you doing? Why are you taking them to parts of the airport where, you, where it is alleged there are no cameras, there are no CCTV? We also wish to know whether any of the detention officers attended the CCTV room or indeed their colleagues and for what policing purpose? Was it legitimate? Were they authorised to do so? And if they were allowed to do so, who allowed them to do so? Number 10, following a press release by my office last week raising concerns at the failure to investigate an alleged hate crime against Mrs. Actor and the failure to detain the alleged perpetrator on the actual day of the incident. On Tuesday, the 30th of July, a week later, a chief inspector from Greater Manchester Police contacted us to arrange an interview with Mrs. Actor. As far as the family concerned, it was too little and too late. 11. Why did the police, a GMP, not consider what had caused the initial altercation at Manchester Airport? Why had they left a distraught victim of racism lying on the ground, bleeding from an injury allegedly inflicted by a police officer? No statement was taken from Mrs. Actor until last Tuesday. GMP confirmed to me a few days ago that following investigation, they believed there was insufficient evidence for a realistic prospect of conviction. The individual, who we understand to be a Kuwaiti national, will be allowed to return home today after having had his holiday. Mrs. Actor feels betrayed and once again let down by the failure of the GMP to act. 12. The family wished to make a public appeal. And this is important. The family wished to make a public appeal to all those within the community that they expect them to remain calm. They do not expect nor will they tolerate demonstrations outside police stations or anyone to take the law into their own hands. The family state the police have had enough to deal with on the streets at the moment and all resources must be deployed to protecting our community from racist far-right thugs. 13. I wish to issue a warning to Greater Manchester Police that the family expect due legal process to take place. No party, no police representatives, no so-called police sources should continue with their attempts to interfere with that process by issuing statements claiming to paint a different picture whilst caveating it with asking people to await the outcome of the IOPC investigation. 14. There must be no further attempts to harass or victimising this family. And let me make it clear, that applies not just to those sat next to me, but also those who are serving police officers within this family. Serving police officers, some of whom have been for decades police officers um, in, in this community. 
15, the family have placed their trust in the IOPC. But that is not unconditional. They are more than aware that this organization does not have a good track record on delivering justice. But they will the robust scrutiny of their investigation, and it must be transparent, and it must be independent. And finally, to conclude, there can never be any legal justification for the use of excessive, disproportionate, and potentially lethal force against a civilian who is incapacitated and poses no threat. Provocation or the loss of control is no defence in law. That's the close of the statement that will be issued to you um, shortly after the press conference. If members of the press media want to ask any questions, could you firstly identify who you are, um, which organisation and your name, please, and if you could speak up as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phil McCann from BBC News. I wonder if I could just ask, uh, first of all, for clarity, the incident uh, that you say happened out of view of cameras, are you saying that that is an assault? And if I could also just ask, um, you've talked, of course, about clarity and context and how there can be no context that would justify the actions of police officers hitting, stamping on heads, hitting with a taser. I wonder if you would also agree uh, that there could be no context that could justify repeatedly punching police officers in the face. Uh, in the first issue with regards to clarity and the use of tasers, what I'd said was there can be no justification for the stamping or the kicking of someone's head when somebody is lying in incapacitated. That's a matter for the investigation to carry out whether the use of tasers was justified. And as the family has said at the start of this press conference and in press releases, that if these two individuals were engaged in criminality, then the family expect them to, to face due, low, due uh, robust due legal process. And I will leave it at that. It's not for me, as the family's lawyer, it's not for the family to carry out that legal process. That's for the authorities to decide what will happen in relation to that. And if I can simply say this, that when an individual is standing at a ticket machine, and I've seen the context that's been provided to the media, um, and seen the context that's been provided to the Mayor of, of Greater Manchester, um, where is the context about somebody's head being pushed out and banged into the ticket machine? Is it normal? for a police officer to approach after an altercation that's happened previously to then grab someone and bang their head into the ticket machine. Is that normal? Or is it excessive? Or is it disproportionate? But that was, of course, a matter for the investigation, for the IOPC to determine. I'm not going to do that for you today. Just for clarity, the incident afterwards, where you say one of the brothers was taken out to an area, yes. are you saying that, that, that what happened there, the putting pressure on getting into a kind of headlock situation, that that was an assault? The, uh, the that's for the IOPC to determine whether that's an assault. It's an allegation that's been made by members of the family. It's for the IOPC to determine whether that was excessive, whether it was disproportionate, whether it was valid. And one must be it begs the question, why would an officer want to take an individual that's been detained and handcuffed out of view, as is being alleged, away from fellow officers, away from his brother and the view of anybody else? It really does beg the question, why? Why would an officer want to do that? This isn't about somebody taking it personally. They are trained professionals. We're not talking about the thugs on the street who are rioting and setting fires to holiday inns and hostels, etc. We're not talking about those individuals. We're talking about trained professionals. They have a duty to uphold the law, and no matter what the provocation, which we have seen so much in recent days, they have held the line and have not acted disproportionately. The officers there that day stand accused of doing something completely different. Do your clients regret any of their actions that day? And how do they feel when they look back at the footage? And I know we have to take the whole thing in context, but when they see themselves raining blows seemingly onto officers, what regrets do they have about their actions? Uh, the family have stated, and I'll say it again, that if these two individuals were engaged in any criminality, then they must allege criminality, then they must face due, robust, legal process. So that's the first starting point. Secondly, I will put on record, because it's on camera, that the two brothers at the time said they were sorry in the aftermath. They were sorry. They feel distraught. Their lives are shattered. They are destroyed. They are victims of abuse. There's Islamophobia. I know it's a word that's not very popular to use at this moment, but they have received re repeated threats. They've received abuse 
on social media. They know the context walk on. They have never even got a speeding ticket in their lives. However, I'm not going to go into the details. As I say again, there are live proceedings. There's a criminal investigation and there is the IOPC investigation that needs to take place. That due legal process must happen. And I'll say this quite simply. Police officers do not have a right within this country to just simply go and lay their hands on somebody and subject them to violence. It has to be justified. And if an individual responds, then they will also require to justify. Self-defense applies both to police officers but also members of the public. We will wait for the due process to take place. But I'm not going to go into the details of what these two brothers feel, but I will say that at the time they did say they were sorry. And the language that was used and the abuse they received subsequent to that is a matter that will form part of the complaint to the IOPC. The phrase you just used, self-defense, that's going to be important to you then moving forward? No, I, that's a matter for the IOPC to investigate. That's a matter for due process to investigate. And I'll keep saying again, it's not a matter for me. The facts, the full facts have to be presented to the IOPC. It's a matter for them to decide. It's not a matter for the Manchester Evening News. It's not a matter for the BBC. It's not a matter for Verify. It's not a matter for GB News. It's not a matter for all the media commentators that seem to be commentating on what happened. What I'm saying is there is a start there is a finish. There is so much that happened. There are statements that still require to be taken from my clients. There are statements that require to be taken from Mrs. Actor. There are statements also, incidentally, without commenting too much, of two individuals who happen to be passers-by, who are seen on live video, on, on the mobile footage, who are standing filming the matter, who I understand are also arrested for fray, who are then grappled to the ground. One of them is, I think, power sprayed, grappled to the ground, and the whole question, I could sit here and say, was that justified? Was that proportionate? Filming somebody, rattling through somebody's pockets, asking for the phone without a warrant, searching for that, is that justified? There's lots of questions that everybody has to answer. We want that process to take place accordingly. Everyone has that questions to answer in this process. Hi, Laura Khan from Al Jazeera. Now, I'm just wondering, the IOPC is looking into whether this could have been influenced by race, religion, or personal belief, and I'm wondering if that's also the belief of the family, considering protesters came out for a couple of days afterwards claiming police brutality and racism. Is this going to be part of your legal process as well? We're not going to preempt. we're not going to conclude with the findings of an IOPC investigation. I appreciate there are police parties or representatives that wish to do that. We're not going to do that. It's a matter for the investigation to decide whether race or religion played any role in this. Of course, the family have asked the question, why after the event when individuals are detained, they are subjected to such horrific treatment? And the question remains that why would the police leave a woman distraught, a grandmother, lying on the floor, bleeding from her eye, with a six-year-old child wandering around asking for his father. Why leave her there? Why would you not pick up the phone or call airport security or ask for medical assistance and say, can we help? And that's a question that they'll need to ask, answer. But I'm not about to get into whether there's racism at the heart of this. That's a matter for Greater Manchester Police to answer. And quite honestly, Greater Manchester Police does not have a great track record. We know of women who have been subjected to violence. We know of women who have been subjected to misogyny. We know of women who have been subjected to unlawful strip searches. We know of people who talk of the word institutional racism time and time again. Yet for some reason, it's left to people of colour, it's left to women to justify the words misogyny. It's left to people of colour to justify whether they were subject to Islamophobia or racism. It's actually not up to the communities to decide. The police will need to prove what's gone on or not gone on, and it's for the IOPC to carry out the investigation. I'm not, going to pre I'm not going to conclude it, as others appear to be doing. It's not for me to do that. It's not for the family to do that. And we'll be quite firm on that. Hi, uh, Ian, I'm a freelancer. A uh, very simple question. Uh, you made reference to... Sorry, what's your name? Ian Leonard, a freelancer. Um, you made reference to an altercation um, near Starbucks prior to what we've seen in the video. Did, did that altercation become physical? Because the, the implication is that it was quite serious and that's why the police responded in the way they did. That's a live criminal investigation. That involves two parties. I'm not going to comment, comment on that. That's a matter for the police to carry out its investigation. What's unfortunate, of course, is it took them a week to get a statement from Mrs. Actor, and that individual is leaving the country today. And that shows how seriously 
they actually appear to have taken it all, the lack of seriousness with which they approached that incident. But that's a matter for investigation to carry out, so I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, yes, uh, Kim Pilling from the Press Association. You said earlier the two lads uh, have said sorry. Uh, what exactly are they sorry for? I'm not going to get into those details. I've said that they said at the time they were sorry, and there was a number of things that were said at the time. That will come out during the course of the investigation. There are live proceedings that will be investigated, and I'll keep saying it again and again. You're not going to try my two clients before a media press conference. This is about context. You've had the mayor of Greater Manchester turn around and say there's context. You've had police representatives. You've had the police federation saying the protectors must be protected. Members of the public also have a right to expect police officers to act within the law. So when the time is right and the authorities that require to be spoken to, these individuals will give their statements at that time. Hello, uh, Greg Wilford from Sky News. I uh, just wanted to ask, the family's previous lawyer said that Fahir was fighting for his life after the incident and had a cyst on the brain. Uh, is that right? Is there an update on his condition now? Um, I'm not going to provide a medical... Uh, well, firstly, I'm not going to con um, comment on the, the actings or non-actings of the previous lawyer. Um, <laughs> no comment on that, um, so I'll have my right to silence on that if you appreciate that. Um, on, secondly, in relation to his medical condition, there's still ongoing in, um, investigations that require I'm not going to give details of that. I don't think it's appropriate. Thank you. Hi, uh, Claire Fallon from Channel 4 News. Um, I wonder if you could just clarify what you were saying about body-worn camera, not all of them being active. Your understanding is it that they weren't activated initially or that during the course of all of this, some of the body-worn camera was turned off? Uh, and also, I mean, you've talked about a cynical attempt, as you put it, by Greater Manchester Police to spin a narrative um, and about a need for due process. I just wonder, with you making these comments today and holding a press conference, whether that actually is in the interests of due process. Okay, so firstly in relation to the body cams, we, we've not been provided full details. What we've been provided details of, whoever, by the authorities, the IOPC, is that the fact is that not all the body cams were on. That's a matter for the investigation to decide was, were they switched off beforehand? What I can tell you is this, that if you carry, um, if you're an armed police officer, if you use power spray, if you use your tasers, then the body cams are supposed to be on. As soon as there's incident rising, 30 seconds earlier, I understand that those cameras are supposed to come on and they're supposed to continue for the process and they're supposed to continue in the aftermath and that information should be retained. If what we now know is that some of the body cams of these officers were not on, it begs the question, in a highly secure area where we know there is a great deal of sensitivity, there is dangers of terrorist attacks, etc., why would you have armed police officers wishing their cameras to be switched off. Why would they have their cameras off? And it begs the question that when you use a taser, why would your cam, cam not go on? If it's not gone on, then it, that's a question that needs to be answered by those police officers. That's a matter for the IOPC. We are not the IOPC. They have the resources. They have the facilities to investigate. These are all questions that they need to, to answer. With regards to spinning a narrative, it's unfortunate because the family have, after we were instructed, kept quiet. And we said we'll approach them. But over the, over the last two weeks, we have seen a consistent attempt, a repeated attempt by the police, police sources, whoever, whatever name you wish to call them, leaking material from a secure site in an airport to the news. What else can you call it other than trying to spin a narrative? Pixelated. Not showing the full narrative, because it's pixelated. We have seen the narrative beforehand from members of the public. So in, kind of, in terms of like interfering with the due process, family had no option. When the family have been portrayed as criminals, Mrs. Acta was called a drugs mule, the brother was called a coke dealer, they were told they were criminals, they've had all sorts of abuse on the basis of their religion, so the family want to set that record right, and they have said, I don't think the family can say anything more than that. I don't know anywhere else where families have come out and said, if members of the family have been engaged in alleged criminality, then they must face robust due legal process. That's the first initial comment that the family said to me. That's the first thing. With regards to spinning a narrative, we have set out some of what the family wish out there in the public domain because they've had no option. It's for Greater Manchester Police to answer the question of how is it 
that that secure CCTV footage managed to hand up, land in the hands of the media. You would have thought that they also wanted the due process to take place, to be fair to the police officers, for their version of events to be told, and for the family then to have it. But that, did, that wasn't allowed to happen. In fact, somebody went running along to the mayor, Andy Burnham, and of course we will be asking questions of Andy Burnham. Who showed you the footage? In what context? Who are those people advising you with relation to the police? What contact was made by your advisors who monitor police powers with Greater Manchester Police? And what was the purpose of that? Was it about spinning a narrative? Because it's not the complete truth. If Greater Manchester Police wanted to leak it, then leak everything. If somebody in the police or the CCTV control room wanted to leak it, you have to ask the question, why? Why would anyone in authority want to leak something? It's usually, as we know, and as Channel 4 know very well, because you're an investigation journalist, is to spin a narrative. And that's exactly why I'm it's not about us trying to spin a narrative. It's putting, it's adding to the context. The family had no option but to respond. And after this, there will be a period of quiet, but we will meet with Catherine Bates, the regional director, and then following that, we hope to have a meeting with Andy Burnham, because if Andy Burnham can meet with Greater Manchester Police or whoever it is that handed him, then also the family expect to meet with Andy Burnham as their mayor. Thank you. Um, you've raised concerns about the police, as you say, not coming forward, not getting in touch with, uh, with witnesses here. Are you asking for other people who witnessed events across the entirety of the airport and on the plane to come forward? We had said right from the offset when we became instructed um, that we wanted members of the public who, in, who either um, saw what happened who may have had footage or maybe witnesses to the incident or also were subjected to unlawful activity by the police or violence to come forward and to contact the IOPC. And if they were uncomfortable about contacting the IOPC, then to contact um, my office. So we, that is still up there. The IOPC has a website. They have details of asking for people to hand over information. I understand some members of the public have already come forward with video footage and other details. That still requires to happen. We have tried to make contact um, with those within Qatar Airlines, other individuals have tried to do that for us. Unfortunately, the situation is that this individual has, is leaving the country today. So I suspect that would be the end of the matter uh, with regards to that. And that's deeply unfortunate because Mrs. Actor was subjected, she alleges, to racial abuse um, and um, what may, somebody may regard as a minor assault, but an assault nonetheless and pretty horrific. If it was your mother sat on a flight for seven hours and was being shouted at and abused in that manner, how would you feel? Um, and of course, that was the starter, to, uh, the precursor to the whole incident that took place. Um, it's unfortunate the police waited a week before they started investigating that. One would have thought that police officers are ten at the time thought there's been an altercation. What led to the altercation? It's a normal question you ask. When somebody is in an altercation on a public street, the first thing the police normally ask is, did you do anything? Why did it happen? Did somebody just come along and an altercation starts? No, there's always a reason, normal reason for it. You believe those questions have not been asked? Why those, do you believe they've not been asked? Those questions were not asked in the initial period, we understand. We, we don't, they didn't come and ask Mrs. Actor for an end statement. They just came along, grabbed fire. They didn't stop and say, excuse me, could you step aside? Could we speak to you about uh, an alleged incident? We need to caution you. Mrs. Actor, could we speak to you? They'd examine the CCTV. Did they ask to speak to her? No, they didn't. Did they ask Fahir to step aside and speak to him? No, they didn't. Did they ask Ahmad to step aside and speak to him? No, they didn't. Did they approach any of the air crew as far as where? No, they didn't. It's a week later that a chief inspector contacts me and says that he wishes to speak to Mrs. Actor as part of their investigation into the alleged incident after we had released a press statement talking about the racist and the hate crime that had taken place. Why? Why does it take a week for them to run and catch up? It's too late. Golden window of opportunity, as we know from the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, is the first 24 hours of a crime taking place. Anybody else? Actually, just a quick clarification. Um, I'm just wondering what footage Andy Burnham had seen that was different from what was released to um, Manchester News. Uh, we're, we're still unaware of what it is that he's seen. What, what you know, but as far as I understand, it's. We, we believe, and it's for Andy Burnham to, to, to say, what is it he's seen? First question is, what did you actually see? Second is, did you see the full footage? 
Did you see the footage beforehand? Did you see the footage at the ticket machine on Pixelated? Did you then see what takes place within um, the, the... He has already said there's two sides or something along those lines, but then subsequent to that, the treatment that is alleged, did he see all of that? Was he shown all of that? And a really important question that Andy Burnham needs to answer as a politician serving his constituents, which includes this family, as includes members of their family or police officers, is like, who showed you it, Mr. Burnham, and in what context? Because after all, this is controlled CCTV. Why has anybody approached Mr. Burnham and say, we want to show you something? You, the first question you would want to ask is, Mr. Burnham is on record on a number of previous occasions. Due process has to take place. I don't want to interfere with the investigation. Yet on this occasion, he felt determined to basically come out and to make a statement. So if he came out and make a statement, then he's got real questions to answer. Anybody else? No? Okay, thank you very much. If you've got one-to-ones, you could tell Naz at the front. Um, we'll try and arrange that.